international business machines, IBM, which this season has brought you town meetings of the world, CBS reports, the National Health and Citizenship Tests, tonight presents Broadcast 13 in this distinguished series. This is not a crater on the moon. This is an IFO, Identified Flying Object. A man, not Superman, jetting in a Bell Aerosystems rocket belt. This is a UFO, Unidentified Flying Object, popularly called a Flying Saucer. To responsible scientists and photo analysts, they are lenticular clouds, sun dogs, planets, balloons, or mirages. First of all, the objects are not unidentified. We know what they are. Second, in many cases, in most cases, they're not flying. And finally, in many cases, they are not even material objects. A real flying saucer looks like this. An Avro car, manufactured in Canada, being test flown in 1961. Or like this free-flying air cushion vehicle being flown by its inventor, Professor Paul Moeller, in 1965. But UFO sightings persist, and skeptics often become confirmed believers. I've slowly come to the conclusion that there are such things as interplanetary spaceships. I'll have to stick my neck out and say that because I believe it at long last. Psychiatrists often call these reported UFO sightings illusions, hallucinations, self-delusions. I'm not saying that there aren't things in the sky that we don't know about. What I am saying is that when there's anything that one doesn't know about, then the mind fills it with a great mass of fantasy. And that most of what we're dealing with in these reports is almost certainly fantasy. Fact or fiction, myth, menace, or marsh gas. This is an age when scientific and technological developments are rapidly making yesterday's fiction fact. How much do we know, and how we know what we know, is what tonight's CBS Reports is all about. CBS reports, UFO, friend, foe, or fantasy. Reported by CBS News correspondent, Walter Cronkite. Good evening. Reports of flying saucers are nothing new. From the beginning of recorded time, men have been seeing unexplainable things in the sky. And there's no reason to doubt they saw something. The question is, was what they saw really there? And what was it they really saw? The great flying saucer mystery of 1966 began here, near Dexter, Michigan, late in March. And before the month was out, flying saucers were being reported from New Jersey to California, from Colorado to Long Island, from Ohio to Georgia. Invariably, the first reports were brought in by quiet and sober citizens like Frank Manor, father of ten children, a countryman, a hunting man, a man used to wooded swamplands by night. Well... Uh, first beginning, uh, we were watching television, and we have six dogs here, and they started raising a fuss, in which they never do much, so we, I went outside and gave a yell at them, and as I turned around to come back on the porch, I looked to the north of me, and uh, there were, looked like a fallen star uh, made there. It was red, and kind of coming down, and on a 40, about a 45, and so then I watched it and I was going to see if it landed and then maybe go down and see what it was and uh, when it got to the top of the trees it stopped and a, a blue and a white light come on it and uh, I looked at it and I thought I was seeing things Frank Manners UFO remained over his swamp more than four hours his children saw it his in-laws saw it residents of the area saw it the police saw it no one photographed it but Sergeant Newell Schneider of the Sheriff's Office remembered it well enough to draw it. No, it uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or rather any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. 
What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. Forty miles away, another swamp land and another UFO sighting. This is Hillsdale, and the girls at Hillsdale College had a night to remember. Well, when I was looking out the window with the binoculars, I guess it was about 12, I saw it, and I saw two red lights, and I saw what looked to be shaped like a pie. I could just see the front of it, and I just saw the round front, and I could see the lights on either side. And then the red light was sort of casting a glow over the whole thing, so it looked like a round disc. At first, when I'd heard the other girls talk about it, I didn't really... I believed them, yet I couldn't really make myself comprehend it because I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. But then when I saw it, I just was fascinated. I wasn't afraid. I, I just wanted to stay there and keep my eyes glued to it. I couldn't leave. I know I saw it, but, and I, I mean, I know myself I saw it, but I don't, I believe I saw it, but I can't fathom it because it seems so unreal. William Van Horn, Hillsdale's undertaker and civil defense director, also spotted the UFO and was out with his Geiger counter next day, checking a mysterious perfect circle where the UFO had been seen. Van Horn did not find any radioactivity here, but this did not shake his certainty that he had seen a hovering vehicle with two lights. Many people ask him why he did not go right up to the UFO in the dark. I'd uh, much rather be a live coward than a dead hero. And uh, with the area of uncertainty that we have here, uh, how do I know but what uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's a current, uh, an electrical charge which is being uh, radiated by one of these vehicles which would uh, uh, electrocute you if you got within a certain area of it. There was no sound whatsoever. I could not hear a, uh, a bit of sound. The Air Force sent its chief scientific consultant on UFOs, Professor J. Allen Hynek, to check the Michigan sightings. Dr. Hynek agreed that the good citizens of Michigan had seen something in the marshlands. He thought they had seen marsh gas. I've had many, many letters pointing out that um, they, as children on the farm, had had many experiences with swamp lights and that this was obviously the thing that it was, and they couldn't understand why the people in Michigan got so excited over swamp lights. And the illusion of motion frequently is given by the fact that a little bit of swamp light appears here, it goes out, another one appears over here, that goes out then, and, but the illusion as viewed from a distance is that the objects have moved back and forth. And sometimes this gas will gather into a ball and actually float away. In Washington, a private unofficial group known as NICAP, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, called a news conference, dismissed the swamp gas theory, and reopened an old argument with the Air Force. NICAP's director, Major Donald E. Kehoe, a retired Marine Corps officer, insisted that the Air Force knew more than it was telling. We are being observed by some type of device which is ahead of us, far ahead of us, and is probably controlled by a highly advanced superior civilization. Now this is a conclusion which I personally have stated and is shared by some members of our Board of Governors and advisors, not all of them. But it has reached to the point where many people in the Air Force have the same conclusion. In fact, the Air Force at one time had a top secret estimate that these things were interplanetary spaceships. So you will see that this, instead of being a uh, subject for ridicule, and a big joke actually is a serious matter which could affect the lives of all of us. And for the umpteenth time in as many years, the Air Force, called before a congressional committee, said it was hiding nothing. Air Force Secretary Harold Brown. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. The hearing this morning was public for just that reason. Uh, in those cases where for lack of data or lack of a convincing hypothesis, the sighting has been kept in the unidentified category, we've been perfectly willing to say that too. But if the Air Force had nothing to hide, and, Frank uh, Manor, the Michigan farmer who had brought and, in the first report, was caught in the middle. He was do. mad. Well, you can look at here, look, beer bottles thrown. Look at my windshield. What would you think if somebody was throwing beer bottles at your house, standing out in the middle of the road screaming, uh, you nut, you're fantastic, and all that? What would you think? 
Are you sorry now that you did tell people what you saw? Yes, I am. I am. I am sorry because uh, it, it, not that, that it, it's not the truth, but it's just the idea, the reaction of the people. They think you're a nut. Tell you the truth, that's just what they figure you are. And I'm not going to take it no more. I don't want nobody down in here. I, I just leave me alone. And if and if the thing lands right there and right there by that pump, I'd never say a word. Then he got out and talked to me. I wouldn't tell nobody. That's just the way I feel. I'm bitter and, and disgusted in the whole matter. And uh, if, if people's going to act like that, I hope one lands right in Ann Arbor, right in the middle of Detroit. If flying saucers had become a painfully closed subject to Frank Manor, they nevertheless remained an intriguing open subject to millions of his countrymen. UFOs had been popularized here and abroad for almost 20 years, ever since a pilot named Kenneth Arnold reported seeing some discs and said they looked to him the way saucers would if you skimmed them across water. As for the latest rash of UFO reports, a pioneer in rocketry and an early popularizer of interplanetary space travel, Dr. Willie Lay, thought he detected a reason. Well, uh, it is very typical that it is a rash, because if you get one report, uh, you get a clutch of other reports following it. It feeds on itself, and the main problem there is that the term flying saucer, or to go official about it, UFO, has produced a label. Uh, in the past, if somebody saw a streak of light in the sky, which he couldn't understand and which didn't interest him very much, well, he might have told his wife that he saw a streak of light, most likely he didn't. But now that he has a label to put to it, he comes home and tells his wife, his children, his neighbors, the policemen on duty and a few other people that he saw a flying saucer. In the days to come, many more people will sight many more flying saucers. To some, these UFOs will be miracles. To others, real but unexplainable. To most scientists, natural phenomena. Some people will be fooled. Others will try to fool the rest. But a few will be expert observers, and their sightings will keep the controversy churning over whether vehicles from outer space are possible, and whether indeed these vehicles already have arrived here. We turn to that part of the UFO story in a moment. Here is a ritual that goes on night after night before each new term in high schools all over the land. This is scheduling. The fitting of courses to the needs of each student and the needs of each student to the new terms classes. These teachers and counselors are searching by trial and error for a schedule that works. Trying out students and classes in combination after combination. Night after night, right up to the opening of school. But in this high school, where 2,000 students have their choice of more than 100 classes, this IBM computer tries out millions of combinations of students and classes and arrives at the optimum schedule in one afternoon. The process starts in a student counselor's office. Hi, Chair. If you're planning on a scientific career, such as medicine, that may be physiology or, or biology... Too. The counselor analyzes where each student's abilities lie and where he needs direction. The counselor then simply marks the ideal courses for the student on one of these lists. These course requests go into the IBM computer. Already stored in its disk memory are related facts about each course, when it's given, how much space in the class. And here's the result. The most workable schedule for every student, coming up as a roster of each class for each teacher. That's one of the jobs the computer does for the teacher. Indicative to the subjunctive moods. Also, you've got about ten minutes left. The computer also scores tests and supplies more information from them. Not only grades, but where each student stands in the class, where the class stands in the state, and the state in the nation. This computer information gives teachers a better idea where more work is needed. The computer also stores grades from the teacher, plus comments on each student. All this information is processed and served back as reports for parents. And as a complete record for counselors 